Can you imagine, ladies and gentlemen, following Arnold on any rostrum? And I've had to do that a number of times. <clears throat> I want to welcome and thank each and all of you for being here this evening. I also want to thank the and greatly appreciate my distinguished friends who said so many kind things. What can you say on your 90th birthday that might have meaning to more than 350 friends and family, some of whom have come from around the world to wish you a happy birthday? While we've always said we have to do better than our previous best, it would not be possible for you to honor me more than you have this evening. Thank you, thank you, thank you from a most appreciative and very lucky 90-year-old man. The first 90 have been very great. <laughs> the fact is, I don't feel 90. In fact, I usually don't feel anything <laughs> until the around, around noon each day <laughs> when I feel ready for my nap. And then I have another challenge. If I'm at work, Lucy says, don't you think you should go home and rest? And if I'm home, my wife says, don't you have something to do at work? <laughs> so I'm not always sure where I'm supposed to be. <laughs> Probably the only person who wishes to be 90 is an 89-year-old. But there are some advantages. As far as I know, I am the only person still standing from the 1944 Marsville High School graduating class. It is therefore very easy to schedule high school reunions. <laughs> Wherever I am, there is a reunion. <laughs> and I thank you all for being here this evening to participate in my 72nd high school class reunion. <laughs> I am no longer concerned about peer pressure. From the vantage point of nine decades of life experience, I want to share a few thoughts on your prospects for reaching age 90 and beyond. Are there things you, you might do to improve those prospects? How can you make each age and year more meaningful and enjoyable than the last? I'd like to suggest some answers to those questions. I sent an email to Arnold on his recent 69th birthday expressing the wish that I might be 69 again, and also sharing that the last 25 years of my life, since my retirement from Nationwide at age 65, have been the best, the most challenging and rewarding of all the years of my life. The fact is I have been feeling that way about each new stage of life. The chances you will live to age 90 
and beyond are very promising. Actuaries tell us that when I was born in 1926, my life expectancy was 56. Today, life expectancy in the developed countries of the world has reached 80 and beyond. Demographers tell us that one half of children born in our country in this century will live to be 100 and beyond. The word beyond should be interesting to you as we also hear the word a mortal being used more and more. Just as lifespans have nearly doubled during my lifetime, it is expected that they will double again during the lifetime of many in this room. Advances in high tech healthcare, genetic engineering, cyborg enhancement, bionics, and the like pretend that few people will die of old age in the future. More will die from accidents and misdeeds of others than from aging. Chronological ages of 150 years will be reached. The promise that many in this room this evening will see that happen should inspire and motivate you to take full advantage of this century plus opportunity. Keep in mind that when I was born in 1926, there were no airlines, cars could travel only a few miles on no highways, there was no thought of TV, silent movies were all that we knew, we had ice boxes, not refrigerators in homes. There was no space travel, no handhelds, no cloud, no cyber world. It would have taken Tony Doherty here from Australia this evening months, months to come to Columbus. He is here in less than a day. We know in the near future that time travel will be cut in half, and we will surely colonize Mars. As we have moved from the industrial age to the age of technology, we have witnessed that technology builds on technology. The future promises unbelievable change. We do know we will be seeing more driverless and flying cars, increased space travel, conquering of most diseases. The potential for change exceeds our knowledge and imagination at this time. You, and most certainly your children, will be there to live in this fantastic new world. What can you do? to increase the certainty that you will reach 90 and beyond? Can each new stage of life be more fulfilling and meaningful than the last? The view that genetics plays an important role in our prospects for longevity is being viewed with less and less productive, predictive importance. My brother and his family here from Louisville this evening had a father and a grandfather who lived into their 90s. Our mother and grandmothers died much earlier. The best test and promise of long life is how you live that life. We know if you don't use it, you lose it. 
and that is a most important physical and mental truth. Knowing the strong sports orientation of those here this evening, I'm certain that you are very physically active, working out or, and or competing. You eat sensibly, you don't smoke, and make certain that you challenge yourself mentally. You must continually monitor your health. We have an entire table here this evening of great doctors who I've encouraged to have as part of their life mission to keep me above ground. <laughs> I also have another table of lawyers whose mission is to keep me out of trouble. One secret of long life is to get things that can be fixed and fix them immediately. While physical health is important, I'd like to share a couple of thoughts on how we might live our life so that we feel each new age, each new stage is the best. They are the thoughts that have guided me. The longer I live, the more strongly I come to believe that there are some basic approaches to life that make all the difference for us and for those we love. They can contribute more to our happiness and chances of success than education, money, appearance, or skill. It is something we can control, and it controls how you see the world and how the world sees you. That enhancing life factor is your attitude, your attitude. I have a small plaque on my desk at home that says, attitude is everything. While certainly not everything, your attitude can and does make a very great difference in your life. My wife of 67 years, Jean, who keeps me justifiably humble, tells me she does not feel that I have a negative bone in my body. Now, whether that is true or not, I will share a story about a friend who is a prime example in this field. A little while back, Time Magazine was doing a cover story on Arnold. The feature writer was a woman who called me from New York. We talked for nearly an hour and it was a very insightful interview. The final question she asked me was, what is the one thing about Arnold that distinguishes him from anyone you've ever known? I told her it was his capacity for enjoyment. Most everything he does he enjoys, not hedonistic pleasure, but genuine enjoyment. It is an attitude of mind. After that phone interview, I called Arnold and told him about the interview and the woman's questions. And he said, that's very interesting. She asked me, what one word I would use to describe myself. And he said, I said, joy, joy. Now here is a man who defines himself in terms of joy. That attitude, that approach to life comes through to all of us and helps make Arnold 
the most special man that he is. Let me share another brief story and insight about Arnold. A few months ago, Arnold was invited to Paris to be a keynote speaker at a meeting of 191 heads of nations at the International Symposium on the subject of world climate change. He is recognized worldwide in this increasingly important field. But then he came directly from that Paris meeting to Worthington, Ohio, where he attended and spoke at a meeting of the Worthington City Council as I was being sworn in for the 24th time as Vice Mayor of Worthington. Think of that. A man goes from Paris, the meeting of the heads of nations, to witness a friend's swearing out in a town of Ohio. That is a very special man and most special friend. Two important subsets of attitude involve how to deal with adversity and worry. You can be sure that life will deliver you some challenges, some curveballs. At age 75, I was working out daily, playing tennis, and taking my wife for evening walks. A problem with spinal stenosis resulted in three operations beginning in the year 2000. For the past 15 years, I have been able to walk only about 30 yards before low back pain requires that I sit down. For a person who always felt he could run forever, that was a very limiting problem. But then I remembered, as I would like you to remember, and add a tudinal life lesson I learned from President Franklin Roosevelt. Here was a man who was elected four times as President of the United States, who led our country through a Great Depression and the Second World War. In his mid-30s, just prior to his plans to run for governor of New York, he was badly stricken by polio. From age 39, he could not walk and could stand only with metal braces on his legs. He became despondent about life. But then a friend told him, you do not have to be a gymnast to be governor of New York. He took that message to heart and then served two terms as governor of New York and was elected president of the United States four terms. He could not walk and could barely stand. I knew I did not have to be a gymnast to help run the Arnold Sports Festival or to serve my community. Worry can be another attitude problem. The realistic thought and question should be for yourselves, can I actually do something about this situation or not? 95% of what we worry about never happens. We can be concerned about whether it is Hillary or Donald, and we should vote, but we should not worry or lose sleep over it. 
the most enriching of all life's experiences is the friendships, partners, and love we share throughout life. This evening is a perfect example of how lives come together over time to create human bonds and friendships that are most valuable and cherished of all life's experiences. Seventy-five years ago, this month of October, there was a Halloween party involving the Morrisville, Pennsylvania high school football team. A game was played called Wink, Wink, during which the girls stood in a circle surrounding the boys sitting in the center of that circle. If a girl winked at a boy and he winked back, they had to kiss. That was the luckiest day and the greatest thing that ever happened in my life. I found and held on to my life's partner, the 14-year-old girl who winked at the 15-year-old boy that evening. Having a loving, caring, sharing, beautiful life partner can and did make all the difference in my life. One friend of mine who heard that story told me he learned an important lesson. Don't wink at Jim Larmer. To my always more beautiful life partner, to our other partners in life, to my wonderful family, four generations are here this evening, to our friends from around the world, we still have some work to do, more joy and great experiences, and I'm sure the best is yet to be. Thank you.